Baruch Hashem Adonai, blessed be the name of the Lord. Today I want to share a short version of the tithing message. Yes, it's the tithing message again, but this one is going to be short and sweet. This is just the main points. The original is still here on YouTube. It should be just below, just below this one, but the original it was, it was so long, I had to split it into two parts. It's about 40 minutes of talking, and not everybody has time for 40 minutes of their time. So I decided to release a condensed version, and this is it. Should Christians tithe? Well, myself, I would be afraid not to. I have to tell you, I would be afraid not to tithe. My wife and I, we tithe, and we never suffer lack. It's completely different when you truly rely on God. He provides for you. You don't, you don't have to strive so much and you benefit from tithing because God is your provider and you have an agreement with him just like Jacob in Genesis 28. You honor him with your income and he provides for you. The main argument against tithing though is that tithing is in the Old Testament. It's in the books of Moses. It's in the law and we're not under the law, so it doesn't apply to Christians. But tithing existed before the law was given. Abraham tithed, and his grandson Jacob tithed. And like I mentioned, Jacob had this agreement with God. He actually asked God for this financial agreement. He said, provide for me clothing and food and peace. Lord, give me peace, and I will give a tenth to you. And that's a tithe. So that's one basis for tithing. And by the way, Jacob established something great for the Jewish people because he set them on the right financial path. The Jews have been provided for for generations and, you know, the typical accusation against the Jewish people that they have money. Well, some of them do and they are provided for because maybe God honors the choices that Jacob made and uh, Abraham as well, and God provides for them. So Gentiles could learn from the Bible and from the Jewish people and also be provided for, instead of accusing the Jewish people of being rich. So that is one basis for tithing, that it existed before the law. But in addition to all the tithing commandments in the law of Moses, there's a lot of exhortations and instructions in the Bible to give and be generous. Simply, the Bible tells us to give. And what else is tithing if not giving? Tithing is giving. It's just legalistically defined giving. And that's, one of, that's another reason that tithing could not be abolished because tithing is giving and giving is not abolished. Still, some people say that the New Testament doesn't command us to tithe. Well, the New Testament doesn't command us many things because it doesn't repeat the law. The New Testament reaffirms the big ideas, the general principles. It's like that with tithing, and it's like that with loving our neighbor, for example. Loving our neighbor is given in the Old Testament in a very expanded way, with many instructions, very detailed instructions on how to help our neighbors and enemies with their donkeys, and there's lots of specifics. And those specifics, they are not repeated in the New Testament. All we get is the big idea, love. Love your neighbor. And it's the same with tithing. We don't get all the specifics about give 10% of your flocks, of your first fruits, give to the Levites, give to the temple, and so forth. All you get is the big idea. Give and be generous. Still, some people say that tithing was cancelled in the New Testament. Well, that is simply not true. Tithing was never cancelled. It's There are no verses in the New Testament saying that tithing is done away with. Some laws were done away with, for example, circumcision. And it's pretty clear that they were. But there's nothing about tithing no longer applying to our lives. We still need to give. But I understand this whole issue about the law and Christianity is kind of confusing. Definitely, we are not judged by the law. We are not saved by the law. But we know that some laws still apply to us. 
For example, the Ten Commandments, do not kill, do not steal. But even within the Ten Commandments, there are doubts and confusion about the Sabbath, for example. Does the Sabbath still apply? Do, do we need to keep the Sabbath? I think I came up with a rule of thumb of discerning if a law is still applicable to our Christian life in the New Testament. And I will have a separate message about this, but this is the preview of how to figure out if a law from the Old Testament still applies to our Christian life. And that rule of thumb is the intent of the law. What was the intent of the law? So, on the example of the Sabbath, what is the intent of the Sabbath? The word Sabbath, Shabbat, in Hebrew means rest. If you want to say rest in Hebrew, you say Shabbat. So that is the intent. Work six days, rest on the seventh day. God did it, we're supposed to do it. Not legalistically, but it's good for us. Be still and know that He's God and rest. Get away from this, the busyness of this world. 24 hours, one day a week, but it's very hard. It's extremely hard to rest for 24 hours. We discovered that when we started taking Sabbaths, my wife and I, and people have this restlessness in them and we need to be productive and move and do something. And God knew that. And that's why he instituted the law of Sabbath. Because without the law, people would never rest. Like truly, truly rest for 24 hours. There needed to be a law to teach us how to rest. And resting is hard, but giving is even harder. And that's why God instituted the law called tithing laws. Because without the law of tithing, people would never give. So Sabbath still stands, I believe, because we still need to rest. And tithing still stands because we still need to give. Another question arises is, should we give 10%? And I believe, yes, we should, because 10% is God's standard for generosity. 10% is where generosity begins. Without giving 10%, at least, we're not being generous. And that is the big intent. That is the big idea. That is the intent of, of tithing. The Bible says, give to God, honor him with your wealth, give to God what is God's. And that is another funny thing, because... I'm talking about Matthew 22, 21, and I'm reading from the Geneva Bible. It says, Give therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and give unto God the things which are God's. Everybody knows the first half of the verses, and I've, I've heard so many Christians quoting, Give therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Such a righteous thing to do. But what about the second half of this verse? Give unto God the things which are God's. The first half is paying taxes, and it seems to be acceptable among people, although taxes are higher than the tithe, and you really get much less for it. People pay taxes, there's some grumbling, but it's okay. But what about giving unto God? Jesus told us this. Give unto God. Now, there are two concerns people have when it comes to giving, and one is uh, crooked pastors. It does happen sometimes. It might happen. Some pastors, unfortunately, love money too much. Probably it doesn't happen as often as the satanic fake news would have you believe. The world hates the church and they want to make us look bad. They want to smear the church. And I believe for every crooked pastor, there are hundreds of thousands of churches that want to do good work. But if your pastor is buying a jet, change your pastor. It's obvious. We need to use our wisdom, we need to be good stewards and pray before we give, use our discernment, do our research. But once you give, it's out of your hands, really. Let's not worry about it too much. Of course, pray and make sure you give to the right cause or right place. But God will honor you for giving. And once you give, it's now the responsibility belongs to the next person, the next steward. And if they misuse it, God will deal with them. Another concern that people have is, I don't have enough to give. And that's not really a legitimate concern. There are promises in the Bible that deal with these issues specifically. And first of all, giving is a percentage thing. You give 10%, you are still left with a 90%. 
and the 90% with God is better than the 100% without God. So if, you, if your salary is very small, you give small. You are still left with the 90%. And the second thing that people say is, after I pay all my bills, I don't have enough left to give. We don't give what is left. We give first fruits. It's a principle from the Bible. The first check written is the check to God, because in the end we give to God ultimately. It looks like we give to a charity, to the poor, or to a church, or to a pastor, but in the end we give to God. And the first check should not be the check written for your mortgage, but the check written to God, first fruits. And then, if somebody is worried that they will not have enough after they give, the Bible deals with this specific thing at least twice. Philippians 4.19 says, God will supply every need of yours. This is in the context of giving. The Philippians were giving to Paul, and they were probably worried that they, there wouldn't be enough left for them. Now, 2 Corinthians 9.8, it's the same thing. You will have all sufficiency in all things at all times, but so that you may abound in every good work. These are conditional promises. God will supply for your needs so that you can be fruitful in his kingdom. But still, it's hard to give, and that's why in Malachi 3.10, God gives us this concession. We can test him. But when you test him, test him with um, an honest heart, in good faith. Expect and believe. Trust him and he will come through. He will provide for you. But if you don't feel like giving, if you are not ready, don't. Don't give. There is no pressure here. Giving should be voluntary. And if you are not ready, then read the verses in the Bible about giving, about tithing, about helping the poor, about money, and let the Holy Spirit convict your heart. But when you do give, you will have less stress, you will be closer to God, and you will love Jesus more. You will love Jesus more because love of God and love of money are on the opposite ends of things. It's like a pendulum. You either love God or you love money. You cannot have both. So once you let go of the love of money, you will come closer to the love of God. It's automatic. You will swing one way or the other. And once you give, you will benefit from tithing, like I said before, because you will have the agreement with God, and now God will take on this responsibility to provide for you. And lately, I have found this amazing statistic about people who give. Eight out of ten people who give to churches have zero credit card debt. And it says here, when you look at the things that consistent givers have in common, this is one of the most obvious. So this is a big thing. If you are a giver, it's obvious that probably you have no credit card debt. See, this is a real statistic, real life data that, that tells us that if you give, God will provide for you. There is the proof. I would never want to go back to my old life before we tithe. I would be afraid not to tithe. It is so great to have this agreement with God. When He provides for you, you will have less stress and you will learn to trust Him. Because it's easy to say, I trust the Lord. Yes, I trust the Lord. But trust Him with your money and then you will learn if you really trust Him. But once you have this agreement with God, you, you will never suffer lack. That's a promise in the Bible. We either believe God or we don't. Money is where the rubber meets the road. So put him to the test and you can start giving slowly and God will come through. He will come through. That's what the Bible says. Thank you for listening. May the Lord richly bless you from Zion. Take care. Bye-bye.